Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O gracious one, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The 23rd Psalm affirms the divine claim on all of us. It asserts the undergirding support, encouragement, and creative love of a gracious providence, indeed as a persistent and persevering shepherd, invested in protecting and nurturing, preserving and emboldening your life, mine, and yes, all our neighbors across the world. We find ourselves cherished by one who restores our souls, accompanies us through the darkest of life's valleys, yea, even the valley of death's shadows, enabling us to resist the terrors of evil. We find ourselves claimed by one who opens a door to a celestial home of goodness and mercy, where we may find ourselves grounded by love, joy, and hope. I wonder, dare we question our universal devotion to this spiritual jewel? It surely surrounds us with majestic, loving, and embracing arms. But mid this profound, elegant, poetic prayer, we discover a particular phrase offering us unique divine assurance. You'll find it at verse five. It reads like this. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. How shall we read our psalmist here? Where does his promise lie? Well, he draws a picture of sustained courage in the face of fierce adversaries. He suggests a host inviting antagonists to dine. He demonstrates an initiative of reconciliation amid human confusion, malice, communal brokenness. What does such an occasion look like, this setting a table in the presence of adversaries? We witnessed in our own Christian story persons of stature risking their lives for God's sake in face of stiff resistance. Dare we cite our sovereign and savior Jesus, who set God's table of grace and peace in face of religious and political powers intent to destroy him? Can we recognize Paul announcing a saving story to those who seek to crush him? In our own time, we witness Martin Luther King Jr setting a table of peace and reconciliation designed to grapple with racism and white supremacy in the presence of political enemies, adversaries like Governor George Wallace of Alabama brazenly proclaiming segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Through Dr. King, we behold a divine table set in the presence of implacable antagonists. Recently, we recognized the life of the Reverend C.T. Vivian, a close associate of Dr. King, an electric preacher, organizer, a dynamic trigger of racial justice in face of bitter resistance. He died on July 17th at 96. At the same moment, July 17th, we learned of the death of John Lewis at age 80. John Lewis, a devout Christian human rights pioneer, a congressional representative from Atlanta, and over the course of widely disseminated tributes, television news captured again, John Lewis in March 1965, crossing Selma's Edmund Pettus Bridge. John Lewis, suffering a cracked skull while collapsing under a vicious police assault on that vividly remembered Bloody Sunday. John Lewis's rich and active life as a Christian American patriot setting a table seeking civil and voting rights against fierce state antagonism, John Lewis earned a well-deserved national celebration. As a new biography by John Meacham declares, his truth goes marching on. In light then of the recent deaths of these civil rights powerhouses, 
the active proclamation in our streets and front lawns that all black lives matter, we may find ourselves amid what could well be a revitalized civil rights movement. Amid this decisive historic moment, and among all these grand religious and historical figures, I want to introduce another whose table God set. Her name, Emma Sanders. She died not on July 17th, as did John Lewis and C.T. Vivian, but on June 24th at age 91. Emma Sanders, born in Claiborne County, Mississippi, the great granddaughter of a slave. She grew up in the west side of communities of Jackson. And as the Jackson Clarion Ledger tells her story, Emma, early in life, confessed Christ and joined the Mount Olive Baptist Church in Westside. She maintained her membership there until she moved downtown to Jackson and joined the Hyde Park Baptist Church and remained a member until her death. She loved Hyde Park, where she served as a deaconess and Sunday school teacher. She celebrated a proud moment when her son, Jonathan, became a pastor of Hyde Park. Emma Sanders graduated from Alcorn State College, the first black land grade college in the United States. She played basketball, ran track, received a business degree, and later graduated from Indiana University with a degree in education, the last class receiving lifetime teaching licenses. Emma Sanders taught school attended her five kids' athletic events, founded a business school, owned a restaurant and the Texaco station at Freedom Corners. But more, her college-age son in the early 1960s found himself engaged in desegregation activity. Emma and her husband, William, joined the effort too. Her grandson told the Times she didn't want her own children to become involved in something that she didn't have a very strong understanding of. The Reverend Edwin King, a white Methodist minister, a Boston University theological graduate, chaplain at Tougaloo College, a civil rights activist, himself jailed, beaten for persistent efforts to desegregate lunch counters and pursue voting rights, testified about Emma Sanders most black parents were telling their kids, you can't do this, it's too dangerous. She decided as a mother that some adults needed to be involved. Emma Sanders became not only an adult in the civil rights movement, she became, as one observer reflects, a force in the movement. And during the winter and spring of 1964, she engaged in the vigorous Mississippi voter registration drive preparing for Freedom Summer. As a restaurant owner in Jackson, she joined in feeding and housing the thousands of registration activists. Activists, by the way, among whom I happened to serve on Freedom Day, January 22, 1964, in Hattiesburg, joining with John Lewis and Bob Moses, Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker on that splendid Freedom Day and at night sleeping on the basement floor of one of the invincible monumental figures of that era, Victoria Gray. Some of you will remember that summer of 1964 when the Ku Klux Klan murdered James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner, stuffed their tortured remains in an earth dam as payback for their voter registration pains in Meridian. Amid this white supremacist terror, Emma Sanders continued to pursue voter registration projects in Jackson. She served as co-founder of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, again joining Bob Moses, Ella Baker, and Fannie Lou Hamer in what the Times called an impassioned challenge to an all-white delegation at the 1964 Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City. There we see the divine table set in face of angry white resistance. We catch a morsel of the crisis when a friend tells Emma Sanders, 
A white acquaintance observed that Atlantic City also housed the Miss America pageant. You'll never see it, she taunted. That convention echoes still in our sordid, racist-soaked political history. Emma Sanders and her freedom delegation suffered hostile, cruel rejection. Dr. King negotiated two black visitor seats. The white delegation vacated the convention. We recall a blistering, scorching encounter. We catch Fannie Lou Hamer lamenting, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. We hear Bob Moses, a founder of the party, insist that after Atlantic City, our struggle was not for civil rights, but for liberation. Emma Sanders joins an inevitable lawsuit, finally enabling ballots printed with black names, altering radically the process of delegate selection to democratic conventions and nationwide public elections. In 1966, Emma Sanders herself ran as an independent for Congress. She lost to a rigid segregationist incumbent, John Bell Williams, but affirmed, we ran strong and that was a revelation. The year after, in 1967, we were able to elect blacks in local elections. Emma Sanders continued her participation in Mississippi politics until her death. And her story drifts to a satisfactory climax. One of the perennial objectives of her life transpired four days following her death. The Mississippi legislature removed the Confederate symbol on the state flag, a miraculous phenomenon Emma Sanders had sought for decades. She never expected any acclaim, said Ed King, her partner in the founding of the Freedom Party, but she would inspire people, not like Fannie Lou Hamer with magnificent speeches on the stump, but in the day-to-day -day managing of the party without ever pronouncing this is the way we have to do it. Her son Everett, remembered phoning his mother and father from school 60 years previously, informing Emma and William Sanders of his civil rights training. Everett reflected, they came along and they moved to the head of the class. Do you recall our psalmist and his table set in the presence of enemies? I think our living God provided Emma Sanders a table set with courage, vision, and indomitable hope, enabling her to resist, to thrive, to claim victory in her time and place, as the psalmist asserts, in the presence of those avowed to challenge and resist her vision and mission, enemies, antagonists, adversaries whose minds and hearts she prayerfully, resolutely sought to reorient, to reform, and God willing, even to recast and perhaps to liberate. Dare we set foot on Emma Sanders' path? Let us pray. We come to your table this morning, O gracious God, a table set with your gifts of patience, courage, and hope, as we in this troubled, broken, adversarial world Pursue human equality, justice grounded in love, a profound, everlasting peace. Amen.